Despite being one of Studio Kara's only non-Evangelion works, The Dragon Dentist went way under the radar on its release in 2017. I do remember hearing about it before it aired from news articles on the new production from the creators of Ava, but I saw basically nothing about it afterwards. There's not that many videos, interviews, articles, or reviews about it at all, at least not in English. That's crazy to me. I may have been late to the party, but since my first watch a few years ago, I can't stop thinking back on it. I've been cycling through this show's ideas in my head for a while, and I'm getting to the point that if I don't talk about it, I'm going to explode. So from here on out, I'm going to go into as much depth as I can on my interpretation of the characters and overall plot of The Dragon Dentist. Basically, this whole video is a spoiler. With that said, let's get started, and what better place to start than with the protagonist herself. The Dragon Dentist stars Nonoko, a young member of, uh, the Dragon Dentist, the titular group that upholds a contract between humans and dragons by cleaning and protecting their teeth, their one weak point. Her energy and overall enthusiasm is brought to life by the impressive vocal talent of Shimizu Fumika in her first, and still most recent, major voice acting role. Nonoko is a novice, having only been on the job for around half a year at the start of the special, but she mostly has the hang of her duties. The Dragon Dentist TV special is an extended version of the first short from the Japan Animator Expo, and just like in that short, in order to become a dentist, Nonoko had to pass the dragon's test, entering his teeth and viewing the moment of her own death. After leaving the tooth, Godo, the administrator of the exam and a senior dentist, welcomes her into the group. The core struggles in the Dragon Dentist all surround the dragon's power over life and death. The vision it gives each dentist of their own death, which they call an oncoming verge, is the most prominent manifestation of this power in the story. Those that take the dragon's test and can be at peace with their eventual end pass and become dentists, while those that can't become one with the dragon's teeth. So why would Nonoko, or anyone for that matter, want to go through this trial with their life on the line just to become a dentist? For starters, I don't think the participants know what the actual test is, though they do seem to understand that their lives could be on the line. But even if she did know, Nonoko is a little bit of a weirdo. Her only motivation in order to take the test is the promise of delicious food if she becomes a dentist. And during the test, her first reaction when talking to her killer is that he's kind of handsome. This is in line with the vibes that the dentists give off as a whole. They're kind of indifferent to the events of the world around them. As part of its contract, the dragon is used as a weapon in the war that their country is involved in, but they seem to have little interest in participating in that conflict or even its outcome. There's also a religious order surrounding the dragon, but the dentists don't come off as religious themselves. They may like and care for the creature, but they don't actually worship it. Their focus and energy is instead put into dealing with the bugs that eat away at the dragon's teeth, known as cavity mushi. In Nonoko's own words, she just wants to do what I have to do and enjoy every meal I get until the day comes. And that really embodies the dentists as a whole. They live a simple existence, doing their jobs day in and day out while enjoying what they can along the way. This contentedness could stem from the fact that Nonoko seems to have no family. She could have siblings, but if she does, they're never mentioned, and her parents died when she was young. It's easy to imagine the other dentists being in a similar situation. They vary in age significantly, and the most senior dentists are not actually the oldest, meaning they join at different stages of life. Being a dentist seems like a reasonable path for someone with nothing else left to worry about. For someone older with no loved ones left, or an orphan with few other options, living a relatively straightforward existence as a dentist could be appealing. There's nobody to worry about them, and nobody for them to worry about leaving behind. Nonoko may be a fairly dutiful dentist, but she's only been one for half a year, and hasn't really had anything to make her question her role. So rather than Nonoko, Godo is really the one who should be looked at as the representative of the dentist as a whole. He's one of the most senior of them, and fully embodies all of the traits they display. Throughout the story, Godo makes most of the decisions for the group, and stays composed through nearly everything that occurs. No matter what happens, he just returns to his duties, tending to the dragon's teeth until the day of his oncoming verge. Noticeably, everything surrounding the dentist is wrapped in very Japanese packaging. The dragon itself has a unique design, but it takes more traits from eastern dragons than from western ones. 
and the dentists wear clothing inspired by a variety of traditional Japanese outfits, eat Japanese food, have Japanese names, and basically all sport traits mostly associated with Asian characters in anime. Even the priests are wearing robes reminiscent of those worn in Shinto. Interestingly, neither Buddhism nor Shinto, the two main religions in Japan, have destiny or fate as part of their doctrine. So while the dentists are in appearance Japanese, the main concept behind their existence is not. Despite that, the aesthetics surrounding them are important and play a part in the role of Belle, the next character I'd like to talk about. Nonoko may be the main character of the Dragon Dentist, but it's really Belle's story. Voiced by Okamoto Nobuhito, Belle is introduced at the beginning of the first episode, following the brief prologue. Nonoko, unaware of the consequences of her actions, notices his body, half suspended in the dragon's tooth, and pulls him out. The dentists refer to Belle as a revenant, a dead soul that's revived by the dragon, and is a sign of a future calamity. Immediately upon seeing him, his blonde hair, blue eyes, and outfit distinguish him as being from the enemy country, who have already been shown to sport appearances that are more western looking. Despite this, and that he hasn't formally passed their trial, the dentists take him in as one of their own. Throughout most of the first episode, Belle is used as a device that introduces us to the aspects surrounding the life of the dentist, and, as should be expected considering his outsider status, he rejects many of them, not being able to understand how Nonoko and her comrades can accept their deaths without any struggle. This becomes Belle's main conflict throughout the story. In the middle part of the first episode, an extremely dangerous variety of Mushi, known as a Tengu Mushi, appears attacking the dentists and causing the oncoming verge of one of their members, Shuzuo. While the dentists later drink in commemoration of his death, Bell refuses to drink in his memory, unable to accept his passing. Koro refers to him as brave as a result, which he uses to describe anyone that defies the idea of fate. It's interesting that they refer to those that don't want to simply await death as brave, considering that a lot of people might see their fortitude in the fate of absolute oblivion to be much more brave. This use of the term, though, refers more to the fact that those who struggle are fighting a destiny that's been foretold by an all-powerful entity. They are brave enough to stand in the face of that future and deny it, even if accepting it would be less difficult. Before experiencing this side of the dentists, Bell had started to grow fond of their way of life, wanting to help the souls of the deceased that passed through the dragon's teeth. But after experiencing the loss of Shuzuo, Nonoko tells him about the trial that they go through and their oncoming verge which he rejects outright. Her response to that rejection is to ask whether living a long life is the only reason to live. And while Bell doesn't have a good answer to this, he remains unconvinced. Bell's mentality could come from a variety of sources. He's the outsider in the story, being from a different country and likely was raised with different beliefs. It could also be from having already experienced his own death. Bell was killed ruthlessly at the hands of his own men definitely not a peaceful passing, and a death that would be very difficult to accept. But at least a large part of it is just his nature. He's wishy-washy. Early on it's pointed out that Bell probably hasn't made any important life decisions for himself. This is a point of distinction between him and the dentist. Every dentist, by the nature of the job, has to make the massive decision to risk their life to gain their position, and to dedicate their being to their duties. While they may live uncomplicated existences after that decision, all of that hinges on having the resolve to make the choice in the first place. On the other hand, Bell is devoid of purpose, always being pulled around rather than following his own judgments. In the same way, he's unable to accept the concept of fate with any sense of confidence, and is incapable of putting his misgivings into words. Over the rest of the special, Bell's actions are frequently driven by this feeling. He doesn't hate the dragon but he doesn't want to lose Nonoko to some indeterminate death. And these feelings both only grow stronger as he develops a crush on her. It's unclear whether she reciprocates, but Nonoko is obviously attached to him as well, to the point where she very slightly talks about her oncoming verge, something that dentists never reveal to anyone. Nonoko's character is mostly static throughout the story, but Bell's feelings for her, along with his new experiences with the dentists, push him to change throughout the narrative. 
This all leads to an incredibly climactic and bittersweet ending, with Bell sacrificing himself to protect Nonoko, the dentists, and their way of life. This whole sequence is excellent. Bell, unsure of why the dragon revived him, finds his conviction and purpose, and gives his life in order to defeat a seemingly unkillable enemy. One way to interpret this is as him accepting the dentist's ways and giving himself up to fate. But I think it's more along the lines of him finding his own answer. Shortly before the scene, he split up from Nonoko, telling her that he can't be a dentist since he has something else to do. At this point, he had already previously told her that he wouldn't be a dentist, but this declaration is much more resolute. While before he wouldn't become a dentist because he couldn't find it inside himself to live like them, here he can't become a dentist, even if he wanted to. Not much time has passed since his last rejection, but the difference here is that he has a clear way that he can protect Nonoko and the dragon. And though some of his final words are, the dragon decides all, I still can't imagine that he would be able to accept Nonoko's death if he were alive to see it happen. So really, he's reached a middle ground. He's not truly a dentist, but he's come to understand their way of life. The following scene of the dentist protecting the dragon as Bell monologues before his death is fantastic. Overall, the score of the special is just alright. It has its highs and lows. But here? They pull out all of the stops. As he dies for the second time, backed by an amazing piece, he expresses how happy he was to get the opportunity to meet Nonoko and wonders how much she'll even miss him, all while hoping that she and her comrades take good care of the dragon. And as Nonoko searches for Belle after this, I have to wonder, how will she react? Which is a question that ties very closely into the third character I want to cover, Shibana. Of all the characters in the show, Shibana is easily my favorite. She's the second dentist that's introduced, and like Godo, is set up to be a role model for Nonoko. Over the majority of the runtime of the first episode, Shibana doesn't play much of a part. Despite being one of the most senior dentists, along with Godo, she doesn't really make many decisions, or fill much of a prominent role. Overall, she comes off as somewhat withdrawn, but there are a few noticeable takeaways. She seems to have a close relationship with Nonoko, who respects her and admiringly calls her Shibana Nesan. She also criticizes Belle upon first speaking to him, pointing out how she can tell that he's never made a decision for himself. And when the Tengu Mushi attacks the dentist, she faces it extremely aggressively, with no regard for her own safety. This is all put into a new light when she betrays the dentist. In the final minutes of the first episode, we learn that the last time the dentists were attacked by a Tengu Mushi was 12 years ago. 25 of them were killed in the attack, including Takemoto, the man that Shibana loved. That loss shattered her worldview, and led her to no longer accept the idea of awaiting one's foretold death. For those 12 years, she raised the larva of the Tengu Mushi, waiting for the perfect time to attack the dragon. Once Godo discovers that she released the Tengu Mushi they had just defeated, Shibana drops her facade and reveals her true intentions with spectacular flair. After merging with the second Tengu Mushi, she finishes the job the first one started, severing the dragon's tooth and leaving it vulnerable. With this, suddenly, all of her behavior is recontextualized. She doesn't play the role of an authority despite being a senior dentist because she doesn't believe in their way of life at all. The various shots of her spending time alone and looking forlorn are because she's detached and isolated. She attacks the Tengu Mushi so aggressively, possibly as an act, but also possibly because, while it will help her accomplish her goals, she also isn't able to forgive the Mushi for killing Takemoto. She doesn't drink in Shuzuo's memory and ask Goto if Shuzuo had told him about his oncoming verge because she personally raised and planted the Mushi that led to his death. And her criticisms of Belle start to feel connected to her relationship with the dentists as well. The choices she discusses mirror the decisions she's had to make herself, which lead her to turn her back on those around her. Shibana isn't unredeemable though. In fact, one of the most interesting things about her is how sympathetic and even slightly conflicted she is. While she teams up with enemy soldiers in order to end the pact between the humans and the dragon, she's not friendly with them and only seems to be allies out of mutual interest. On top of that, she never really directly attempts to kill any of the dentists. There are two scenes where she fights them, but nearly all of her interactions with them are reactionary. 
They try to stop her, and she fights back. I don't even know if the second one should count as a fight, since she actually just flies past them. When she and her allies get close to succeeding in their plans, she also warns the dentists to get off of the dragon while they have the chance. And even though she may have caused Shuzuo's death, she seems somewhat remorseful about it. But more than anything, the way she treats Nonoko shows her soft side. Though she was detached from the dentist as a whole, Shibana was actually affectionate towards Nonoko. And despite her betrayal and transformation, she feels the same way afterwards. She saves Nonoko multiple times, even protecting her from her more violent allies. And along with this, she even hopes for Nonoko to grow into a good woman, not knowing that she's doomed for an early death. Shibana refers to her transformed self as a monster multiple times, and thus not necessarily limited to a physical sense. She wants Nonoko to avoid going down the same resentful path as her. This is another major part of what makes Shibana so fascinating. If Godo is the ideal embodiment of a dentist, having fulfilled his role properly for years, then Shibana is the most corrupted form of a dentist, having turned her back on everything they stand for in order to pursue what she feels is a better future. At one point she was accepted by the dragon, and passed its trial, but her sense of understanding with it was broken by traumatic events. In this way, Shibana represents a darker path that Nonoko could go down. The penultimate scene of the special is Nonoko searching for Bell after he's died, and this deliberate choice makes her implied future discovery of his death out to be a very significant moment for her. While I doubt she would go as far as Shibana, the loss of someone she grew so close to could challenge her worldview, but she could just as easily accept that he's passed on into the dragon's teeth. The juxtaposition of Nonoko and Shibana is really appealing to me, and it seems especially intentional. Shibana's voice is provided by Hayashibata Megumi's stellar performance. Interestingly though, while Shibana didn't exist in the original Animator Expo short, the girl in the short is also voiced by Hayashibata, who impressively nails the younger role. On top of this, unlike Godo, who's nearly identical in both versions, the girl's design is noticeably different from Nonoko's. And on a closer look, you can tell that Nonoko and Shibana, when she was younger, both share some traits with her. These details make me think that there may be more to the connection of these two characters than I initially thought. While we don't know the original girl's name, I doubt that she's actually supposed to be a young Shibana. That would be stretching a lot. To my knowledge, the two versions of the Dragon Dentist are not canonically connected, so the special is not a sequel of the short. But even if it were, the events in the short basically entirely match Nonoko's backstory in the special, which would make her the girl, and they likely just decided not to reveal or hadn't picked out her name. At the risk of still reaching a little bit though, it seems possible to me that they wanted Shibana to fill the role of a corrupted, older version of Nonoko which may have caused them to reuse design elements for the girl in both of them. It's unfortunate that there's so little information on the production of the Dragon Dentist, because these are the kind of details that make me curious about how the creative decisions surrounding different works were made. I definitely could be overthinking it, but there also could be a connection there. The more I think about this character, the more interesting she gets. She's not even close to being the first character whose corruption or betrayal is mirrored by a physical transformation, but she is a great execution of the idea. I already like the strange, alien look of the Mushi, and monster girls in general are great, so there's nothing for me to dislike here. I love how her human spine is partially intact where her body meets the Mushi exoskeleton. I love how she has a humanoid form that she adjusts into when it's convenient, I love how her voice is warped, but only when she's in full Tengu Mushi form. I love the uncomfortable, insectoid, crackly, popping noises she makes when she moves. It's not even the most grotesque design, but it still manages to be unsettling, and I love that too. But even outside her design, her somewhat pitiful character is also appealing. She steeled herself to accomplish her goals, using nearly any means she can to disband the dentists and revive her lost lover. This somewhat tragic, ends justifies means type of character also isn't new, but in conjunction with all her other aspects, it feels well executed. In the end, Shibana is just lonely and depressed. Outside of being an incredibly beautiful cut of art house style animation, her attempt to find Takemoto's soul in the dragon's tooth is a heart-wrenching scene. For 12 years, she alone has been mourning a death that the rest of the world has either forgotten or moved on from. And, having internally rejected the ways of the dentists, there was no one around her that she could really talk to. 
when you realize that the scarf that she wears is the same one Takemoto wore before his death, you can't help but feel bad for her. Even after all she's done, the dentists don't hold her actions against her, which is in character for them. But while this plan failed and accidentally caused hundreds of deaths, she doesn't intend on giving up. Relatedly, the last character I'd like to cover is the ally in her schemes, Blanco. I said earlier that while Nonoko is the protagonist, this is Belle's story. And so, while Shibana is the most prominent and developed villain, Blanco is really the greater threat and is the one Belle needs to overcome. While Nonoko, Belle, and Shibana receive backstory and context that slowly builds a sense of endearment towards them, Blanco gets none of that. The first time he appears is in Belle's initial flashback to his death, and from his first real full appearance in the second episode, all he does is ruthlessly kill anyone in his way, friend and foe alike. Blanco only really has a few major traits that can be gleaned from his screen time. The first is that he is mercilessly cold-blooded. He actually kicks the whole story into action by ordering his men to kill Bell, just because he saw him as weak and a liability. The second is that he has a large knowledge of the dragon and a just as large resentment of it. His common goal with Shibana is to capture and destroy the dragon's wisdom tooth, the object that binds his pact with humans. And judging by the fact that one of his men expected to sell the tooth for money before he kills him, it's totally possible that this mission was personal and not planned by his commanding officers. But Blanco's most intriguing trait is his third, his unshakable confidence that he will not die in any situation. This trait is somewhat of a twisted version of the dentist's beliefs. While they understand and accept the fate that they are dealt, Blanco feels more like he is using fate to bend the world to his will. We don't know why he believes he won't die, but Throughout the second episode, he casually walks through the line of fire repeatedly, and never gets so much as a scratch. And this steadfast, resolute belief comes in contrast to Bell. While Bell rejects the idea of destiny, he comes to care for the dragon and the dentists. Blanco, however, accepts his own idea of fate, but rejects the power of the dragon. Despite originally being on the same side, the two are opposite in nearly every way. It's only when Shibana enters the dragon's tooth and accidentally unleashes a giant cavity mushi that Bell is able to end Blanco's rampage, letting himself be killed a second time and causing the mushi to attack Blanco due to his bloodlust. Bell overcomes the indecisiveness that caused Blanco to kill him in the first place and fulfills what he believes is the role the dragon revived him to play. At the same time, he overcomes Blanco's self-serving sense of destiny by causing him to meet his demise earlier than he would have ever believed. This completes Bell's cycle, as he protects the dragon, the dentist, and Nonoko using his newfound resolve. The dragon dentist is nearly entirely formed around one single question. If you knew how, and roughly when, you would die, could you accept it? Like any strong introspective work, it uses a vibrant world and characters to make the exploration of that concept more rousing than it would be otherwise. And it even does it without really picking a side. The dentists may be the good guys, I guess, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're right in the way that they live. And they acknowledge that fact themselves, admiring those that have the bravery to struggle in the face of nigh certain defeat. Blanco and Shibana are the villains, but while the dentists oppose their actions, at least in Shibana's case, they don't entirely reject her perspective. Bell's conflictedness throughout much of the special plays a part in this too. He wants to care for the dragon and the souls of the dead that it guides, but he can't approve of its foretellings and doesn't like how the dentists accept their oncoming verge. In one way, this is part of his indecisiveness, but in another, it shows that those mindsets aren't necessarily wholly incompatible. But even though the story feels very well realized in this sense, there's still a decent amount of open questions left on the table that could lead into even more explorations of its themes. What will Nonoko do when she finds out Belle's gone? I could be wrong, but I can imagine that it would probably be more impactful for her than Shuzuo's death, or any other deaths she's experienced. Considering how central this is to the story's ideas, I think her response would be very important to understanding her deeper as a character and could lead to an interesting reevaluation of her own way of life 
even if we should expect her to continue being a dentist based on her oncoming verge. Speaking of which, what's up with Nonoko's oncoming verge? There is obviously some kind of idea behind it, considering the small dead dragon lying beside her corpse. The boy that will kill her is also shown at the end of the special, but survives the attacks from the overgrown Mushi, which only targets those with killing intent. His trembling in Nonoko's oncoming verge makes it feel as if he's unsettled by what he's done, and something has to bring him to the point of becoming her killer from having no bloodlust at all. Is his change just because of the reality of war that he has to face, or is there more of an idea explaining his shift? I'm also curious about Shibana's oncoming verge. Did she see her own death in the form of a half Mushi? I doubt it, because that would mean in her attempt to thwart fate, she would have played right into it, but it's possible. And if she didn't, then she actually changed her future, which means that the dentist's belief in their absolute fates is flawed. Additionally, what's up with Blanco? He may have died, but there's still a lot to wonder about his intentions. His knowledge of the dragon could be explained by Shibana giving him information, but that still doesn't explain how personal his vendetta against it seems. And is there a reason why he's unable to be harmed? I keep going through and mulling over these questions in my head. Two 48 minute episodes is not a lot of time to cover as much as the Dragon Dentist does, but while this is all unexplored, I'm not sure if it needs to be. After the first time I experienced the Dragon Dentist, I was pretty confused. Not only does it have a strong pedigree with notable names attached to it, it was good! The fact I hadn't heard nearly anything about it got the better of me, and while I don't usually seek out reviews, I was curious what other people had to say. And the biggest trend seems to be that people wish it was longer. I'm always hesitant to agree to statements like that surrounding works. It's easy to fall into a trap of wanting more even when a story has been fully told. And the story this special sets out to tell is complete. We followed Belle's journey from start to finish. But the story surrounding Nonoko, Shibana, and the rest of the dentists feels like it's just begun. A large part of that are the open questions and teased elements that I mentioned before. But another reason is because throughout the course of the special, Belle is the only character that really changes in any way. Shibana may have had her true intentions revealed, but she only changed in how we view her. She didn't actually develop herself in any significant way. And Nonoko, Godo, the other dentists, and Blanco stay the same in their motivations the entire time as well. This works great here, but it makes me feel like there's still so many possibilities to delve into. This series is Maijo Otaro's brainchild, and the only other work of his I know is It Invaded, which is a very different kind of show, so I have no idea what direction it could go in. While it's also the latest Tsuramaki Kazuya and Enokido Yoji collaboration, it feels very different from their past work in a lot of ways. Fooly Cooly is more of a coming of age story, and Die Buster, like Gumbuster before it, is more focused around triumphing in the face of hopeless odds. A very different idea than the concept of letting things happen as they will and accepting it. And knowing that is just another draw that makes further expansion on the story an appealing idea. I kind of like how the Dragon Dentist special didn't decisively pick a side as to whether it's better to acquiesce to fate or struggle against it. But to some extent, I feel like that prevented the characters, other than Belle, from exploring outside of their personal ideology. I'm at a point where I'm okay with it whether they expand on this universe or not. I won't lie, I want more. And it seems like that may have been intended, considering how many teased ideas there are, not only surrounding the focal characters, but even simply in the universe itself. The sequence set in the future, at the beginning of the second part of the special, makes it clear that the dentists will continue to exist, so there's definitely still some hope for a continuation, but it's been four years without any word on the franchise. And on top of that, remember how I mentioned that Nonoko was Shimizu Fumika's only major voice acting role? Well, that's because, after finishing work on The Dragon Dentist, she quit her talent agency and abandoned her acting, voice acting, and modeling careers in order to exclusively produce films as part of the Japanese happy science cult. It's not like she couldn't be recast, especially considering that the girl from the original short wasn't voiced by her in the first place, but recasting within a single version of the continuity is a little different than changing voice actors between reimaginings. I doubt that they would actually want to recast the role, and I imagine that the loss of the lead voice actress would have to be discouraging. 
I'm still holding on to some hope, but my expectations are tempered. Even if they don't give us a continuation of The Dragon Dentist though, it is absolutely proof of the studio's ability to deliver exciting original works. I'm sure Kara will only create more fantastic worlds, so no matter what they put out next, it'll definitely have my attention. Thanks for sitting through this long ass video. I knew it was going to be a bigger one before I even started writing, and I really appreciate anyone who made it all the way to the end. If you liked it, or if you have different interpretations, let me know. I'd love to hear your opinion. Thanks again, and I hope to have more content up soon.